went to school in Derry. Um, yeah, so I was a, did just just yeah, go just for it. In, okay. Yeah. Um, so I was adopted um, right uh, like a few days after I was born, um, and uh, being adopted is just like I think for anyone, no matter what their situation is, um, it it changes your life even if you're going into like a great situation and coming out of a bad situation or you know whatever your circumstances um i think that um it leaves like some marks on your life and some questions um and so growing up i always kind of dealt with those questions of like why wasn't i good enough why wasn't i loved enough to be kept by my original family um all those identity questions yeah those were huge um yeah, just like in, in like really like put some mark on you of like, am I worthy enough? Am I loved enough? Um, I remember my wife saying something to you and it's it's coming to my mind. <clears throat> I remember her saying to you right after we prayed, her saying, Th- thank God your mom chose life for you. Yeah. And and so if anyone's listening who's who's have any identity issues, thank God you have life. Yeah. You know, that's a good place to start. Yeah. You know? So keep going. I just want to interject that. Yeah. So, um, so you're in the foster system, you get adopted, you're in a family. Yeah. So I was adopted like right out of the hospital. Praise, praise the Lord. Um, so I never went through the foster system. I have a brother who was, so, um, he went through that, but I was adopted right out of the hospital. Um, and I grew up in a, I would say like a pretty normal family. Like I, it was just my mom, my dad, my brother. Um, we grew up going to church. Um, and yeah, like that, it was, it was just a normal kind of cultural thing for us. It never became anything personal. It was just, this is what we do on Sundays. Right. Um, and that was Catholic church, right? Yeah. Yeah, Grew up Catholic, still Catholic. Um, and yeah, um, and then what, what, what changed in that situation? Like, so you're at what age? You're seven or eight. You're still in this family. Yeah, seven and you or consider eight. them your family. Yeah. The, I mean, this is all I've known. Like, it's my mom, my dad. Right. Um, and I think one of the really, like, uh, the blessings of, like, how my parents raised me and told me I was adopted is, like, I've always known. Like, I don't remember a time where they were just, like, sat me down and were like, okay, you're adopted. It's just like, I've always known I was adopted. So it wasn't like this huge shock or anything. Um, yeah. So I was about seven or eight. Um, and, um, around this time in my life, I started, um, being sexually assaulted by a family member. Um, and this, this happened for a few years. It was probably like three or four years. This continued on. Um, and, you know, I was so young at this point that like, I didn't really know what was happening. Like I didn't understand, like I knew this wasn't, I knew something was off. Having daughters, I can't even fathom. I I can't, I my mind can't even go there. I can't comprehend a seven or eight year old girl in that situation. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Um, but I think, up ahead there's there's like amazing things for you yeah i really do believe that like a long line of girls standing behind you asking for help yeah so this is the beginning of that doorway opening yeah so thank you for your bravery your courage um i know this is a big deal for you like i don't take this lightly (laughs) yeah thank you so yeah so i mean at this point in my life like between the ages of like probably 7 to 12 i was experiencing this And, um, yeah, put uh, like, I didn't know what was going on and I didn't know, like, is this something I should share? Is this something that's good? Is it bad? Like, is it wrong? Is it right? You know? Um, and I kind of like figured that out in in a weird way. Um, it was probably like in the middle of this time that I made a passing comment to a friend of mine, um, who was in my class and his reaction toward it kind of just showed me like, oh like this you, isn't normal. this isn't normal like you don't talk about this um and our friendship kind of like ended right there and then and it was kind of just like this shock for me of okay like I, I can't talk about this ever again um and yeah like the, it changed like it it put me in this really dark place like um I knew 
Plus, those are your formative years, 12, and yeah. you're coming into being a teenager. And wh- where was God in this process? Was that... Bef- so did you turn to Jesus? At, I don't know that part of your story. Yeah, I can't remember. So I, I wouldn't say that I really dove into my faith much at all until I was, I was in high school. That's really... Like, I knew God was real when I was younger, but like what I say to the people is like, I knew God was real because I knew evil was real. Ah. And like. There had to be good. Yeah. The existence, yeah. Yeah, the existence of good and evil like was very real in my life. Whoa. Like for like, and not just in, you know, like these specific circumstances, but like there was a lot of things in my life that um, made that evident to me. So, um. So yeah, I uh And then that friend even died, you said. Yeah, he passed away when we were in 6th grade. Um in 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 an accident. And so that's like almost reinforcing, you know, and I've said this before on the program, when you have a destiny that's in you, God puts destiny in all of us. Yeah. The enemy brings a lie opposite of that destiny every single I've seen it in hundreds of people yeah. and a lie opposite of that destiny to get you to not believe the promise. Right. And that's his agenda to kill. He has one agenda to kill your destiny. Yeah. So the the power of what you're doing, you're crossing over into a threshold. You're coming closer to your destiny than you've ever been. Right. Amazing. So keep going. (laughs) Yeah. So like I, it was in sixth grade that he passed away and it was at this moment that I was just like, okay, like look what happens. Like I told him about it. I lost a friend. Like his friends, like they, they didn't know anything, but they would kind of like treat me weird as like that weird person that, you know, um, and, and then he passed away and I was like, okay, like look what happens when I share what happened to me. Like, I can't talk about this ever. So I, I didn't tell, I didn't talk about it. I didn't tell anyone for years and years and years. Which is the enemy's mental games that he plays, right? Yeah. It's, he, uh, he takes something and then he twists it. And then until you verbalize it, uh, it becomes a it's a big uh, hornet, hornet's nest yep. in your head uh, and a stronghold in your head until you verbalize it and then you begin to verbalize it and you go oh, wait that's not that's not that doesn't sound right he, he starts but until building. it's in your head yeah you, you it's very real when it's yeah. there yeah. he yeah. loves to build strongholds with vain imaginations yeah and we know those scriptures and those are he, brick by brick. He builds us the case until it's a stronghold. It's a tower that yeah. we literally are like engulfed in. Right, right. And so you're in this, man, I can't even imagine at, at that age losing a friend. That's a lot to take in. Like, oh my gosh, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> it's by the grace of God that you're alive. <laughs> I know. It really is. It really is. Like it was about this time that like anxiety started like playing a role in my life. Um, and like, like I said to you before, anxiety like really displayed in me more, um, more physically than it did like mentally, um, or even more emotionally to, than it did mentally. Yeah. You shared uh, at, through our spending time together. It was almost like epileptic yeah. <clears throat> type seizure type, that level of stress and anxiety yeah. in your body. Mm-hmm. So I, I've passed out so many times in my life, just like from stress and from anxiety. Um, or like I would get like really sick, like I'd get nauseous and I like even like even going into new situations like I remember oh I was gonna have a sleepover at a friend's house and on the way there I got so sick in the car from being so anxious about going into a new situation that I like had to turn around and go home and that's just like one time of just like I'm going over a friend's house you know and I like had this overwhelming anxiety um yeah so so you're learning to live now with this with this anxiety right you're it's becoming part of who you are yeah so you're in high school now and what tell us what in the world how did you survive oh my gosh (laughs) high school does anyone survive high school (laughs) um i i would say like my freshman and sophomore years of high school was when i was just like really trying to like find myself and like just like understand how how to be a teenager so you know? you're still with the same adopted family or did yeah you, okay. I've, I've been with them ever since i was a baby praise wow. the lord they're amazing um my parents love them <laughs> i could cry over it i um, bet so uh yeah so like same family but like you know in high school you're i went i went to a high school like i want to i think it's like so the you're in biggest the public one. school system mm-hmm. yep. the biggest one in the state i went to pinkerton it's 
four thousand kids and like so steve it, has experience with pinkerton yeah. yes i do it's it's <laughs> and overwhelming the, and the pinkerton police but that's for another day <laughs> yeah. go ahead um and so you know like there's it was the first time coming out of like my middle school was like 300 kids and then I go into a school of yeah. like 4,000 and you're just like so overwhelmed and you're trying to find yourself and I didn't have a lot of friends like I was bullied a lot when I was a kid so like it was like trying to find this whole new friend group and find who I was yeah. and that so kind of Jesus is still kind of like totally just this person the in the scene. sky right. who yeah. watches life happen like he he wasn't anyone personal to me he but Kinda, you're still going to church every Sunday. You're still doing yeah, the family thing. But yeah. Jesus wasn't personal yet. Mm-hmm. Like okay. I said, like my family, it was more of a cultural thing to go to church on Sundays. I was raised Catholic. Yeah. I, same, I live, yeah. Same I life. The same, yep. exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um. So, yeah. And I think it was about like my sophomore and junior year that anxiety really started to amp up like I'd be in school and I would start having these panic attacks in class and I'd have to like leave class and just like go to the bathroom and just like try to calm myself down in like the middle of the school day um and uh, I was getting to like this really dark moment of my life like um in high school I was you know like while you're trying to shove down your anxiety you like I was I was getting pretty depressed and I was self-harming to try to like release whatever was inside inside, of me and so um it was about my it was my junior sophomore junior year that um uh my best friend Alyssa we've been friends since we were three she's like such a godsend to my life um she would always come onto the bus like on Monday mornings and just be talking with her friends about like, oh yeah, like youth group was last night and we had so much fun. There's music and there's food. And I'd always be like, food, music, like, <laughs> you know, like that sounds fun. Hanging out with your friends. Um, and so I was just like, can I, can I come? This sounds fun. Like, you know, like I, I wanted community. Right. I didn't know what community was, but like there was that like internal crave for something within me. Right. Acceptance, belonging, safety. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, like I was getting to a point in my life where I was just like, look, like, look what, like, where do I belong? Like I, my original family didn't want me, like I was adopted. They didn't want me. And then I come into this new family and I'm not treated with love and respect there the way that I needed to be. And so I was just like, where, where do I belong? Who, why am I here? You know? And so, like, she started inviting me to go to her youth groups, and it was at this church, like, going to the youth groups that I really started to know about Jesus and, like, a, what a personal relationship with Jesus is. Um, and it was, like, the first time in my life that, like, I really, like, actually started praying, um, not just, like, sending up, like, some, right. like, Smokes I need no your help, Lord, <laughs> like, right. you know, right. like, it was just, like, I can, like, bring like my heart to him and he can hold it and he can, you know, so it was, it was about like this time in junior year when that's awesome. Yeah. Like I started like actually having a relationship with the Lord and craving more of it and craving more and more. Um, and it was also around this time that like, cause of course I'm coming close to, to Jesus. And so the evil one's going to fight it more. So I was like, at the same time I was like really battling like depression and anxiety. Um, and I remember like one day, like I was doing a job with a friend of mine. His name is David. And um, we were shoveling roofs, sh- shoveling snow off of roofs. It was oh like gosh. a day in February. That's New Hampshire people. Yeah. If you're from the West Coast, you can't <laughs> understand what we deal with. But and, when you get two feet oh of gosh. snow, you have to shovel your roof, which it's I don't true. advise. Because <laughs> you can fall. That happened to me. Yeah. We were like 16, 17 years old and we're like, we need the money. So like, let's go do this. Um, and like. That is hysterical. <laughs> Like, like I don't like heights and I don't like the cold. So like the first time I, I don't saw know it, why I was there. You no, know, a slippery roof, but whatever. I saw, yeah. so I saw a guy like chucking this huge thing. Pull, I'm like, what is this guy? He's like, so I went over there. I was like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, it's a roof rig, you idiot. I was like, what? What's a roof rig? <laughs> 
Yeah. So like, I don't, I don't know why I was there. It, I mean, like the only reason I know why is because the Lord put me there because I don't like heights. I don't like the cold. And yet here I was shoveling snow off of like some cabins in New Hampshire. Um, and it was, uh, this day that I also was like at my lowest point, like emotionally and mentally. And, um, I was, suicide was like in the back of my, in my head. Um, and, uh, so I was talking with, with my friend David and suddenly out of, we're just talking about life, you know, like talking about our lives and he suddenly brings up that he, um, was sexually assaulted when he was little. Whoa. And I was just like on the roof, on on this roof in the middle of February. Um, that's totally Jesus. Yeah. And I was, I was so, oh gosh, I was so taken back. I was like, why, why are you saying this out loud? Like you shouldn't talk about this. Like it was almost like, like I was almost like, do you know you what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. Inside, you, yeah. And he just like started sharing his, his story. I mean, he's a pastor's kid, so he's like as open as any book, you know, but, um, he finished his story and was just like looking at me and I was like, Oh, like me too. Like it just like fell out of my mouth. Like, Oh, I want, I went through that too. And, we kind of just like looked at each other for a minute and he was just like, okay. Like, and, and, like I think he like knew was that waiting for, yeah. for you to process this. Yeah. Um, and I like, I told him my story and I told him that like, I hadn't told anyone and, um, because like he went through it and his family went through it. Like he was like, Hey, like I'm, I'm going to put you in contact with my mom. Like she's a really good person to talk to about this. And so this was like a huge pivotal moment of my life of just well, how like How old are you at this point? Uh how old was I? 16. 16. Wow. 16, 17, yeah. Um So yeah. you did you go talk to her? Uh, yes. So I, I went and talked with his mom. She's amazing. Her name is Mary Beth. And um I didn't like know what was gonna come of this. All I know is like, okay, suddenly this huge thing is coming in. Like, I've never shared this. I'm going to talk to someone about it. Like, what's... I didn't know what was going on in my life. Um, But being able to say to him, like, on the roof, like, oh, like, I went through that too. Like, like I let go of something, you know? It was the first time in, like, eight to ten years that I, I said something about it. And so... I went and talked with his mom and obviously she's an adult, so she's a mandated reporter. And so like, I remember, uh, is that a thing? I didn't know that. It is. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. So like if a minor comes to an adult and like shares that they've been like abused in some way, shape or form, the adult like has to report it. And so like, I didn't know this, but then like at the end of our meeting, she's like, like, I need to let you know that this needs to happen. Um, like I mandated, like I could get in trouble for this if I don't. And I was just like, oh, like I didn't know that this was going to be this big. So yeah, like it, m- my story came out. Um, I had to like go talk to, you know, like the, the big people about it, like DCYF and my family found out for the first time ever that this happened. And Wow. My anxiety, like, so they really... they had no idea the whole time? They had no idea. Yeah. Um, so your anxiety ramped up? Ramped up at this point. Because it, it, it felt like my whole world was, like, falling down. Like, suddenly there's this huge, big issue with my family. And I have no one to talk to. And uh, it was just... Like, when you shove down your trauma for that long... And then suddenly it comes back up and it comes out. You're almost re-experiencing it. So I was like almost like reliving trauma sure, again. It triggers in your body, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. It yeah. all gets triggered. Yeah. It all gets elevated. Yeah. Yeah. And Been so, <laughs> and so like I, at this point in my life, like, yes, I, I know Jesus and like, I'm trying to like cling to him with like every last like portion of me. But like at the same time, like it felt like everything was just like falling to pieces. Um, 
and you know over time like things so got you're still better. going to youth group at this time yeah you- i'm still going to youth group i was like very involved so, like i got really involved with my church and like i really wanted to seek jesus out so like i would go to like multiple churches multiple <laughs> like youth pastors and just amazing? be like i want to know like the lord more like i want to know truth and like i'd literally like drive after school to like churches and to like youth pastors and be like so what does this mean like why like what is you know and just ask questions about the gospel about the lord and because like i like i wanted that so bad i wanted to know the truth i wanted to know who he was because like i i guess like at this point in time like i knew that he wasn't just like this person in the sky like watching life happen and I wanted to know him more personally and really just like let him like change my life. Um, well, there's something about, you know, when you're, when you're hungry and you're thirsty, yeah. there's nothing else that matters yeah. until that is filled. Yeah. Right? If you're thirsty, there, you know, you'll walk past a thousand other things to go get a glass of water Yeah, and you'll walk 10 miles to find a glass of water. And so yeah. that's, that's why Jesus says, you know, to be hungry and thirsty for me. So here you are, hungering and thirsting for the Lord, yeah. and you're finding Him in this process. That's so then this bomb goes off. You're like, <laughs> you know, you're you're now like empty glasses of water, double fisted. You yeah. know? <laughs> How do I get to the water? Yeah, and so like I just like dove head first. I, d- I I just was like, I need I need this. This is the only way I'm going to be able to like hold on. You know, um, and so. Yeah, I, 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 I did that and I found the Lord. And um, if I didn't find the Lord, I would be in a, like a very different place. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like I can see how that would have played out in my life. Like the statistics of people who are adopted and who go through sexual assault, like most of them end up with drug and alcohol problems or like sell themselves on the street or, you know, just like end up homeless like i like i know the statistics of where where i should have been um so you you meet jesus mm -hmm. um what what happens with the bomb that went off like so but you're still struggling with Mm -hmm. you know panic and anxiety and yeah so i would say um my panic and anxiety started to slow down at the end of my senior year Uh um at that point in time i was like pretty strong in my faith like i had found truth and Um, yeah, I, like, I was, like, moving forward with my life. I decided that I wanted to do mission, so, like, I did three years of mission out out of high school, um, and, like... And what does that mean? Like, for people who maybe don't know what that means, some people think that means, you know, you go to Mexico or, you know, Taiwan, and you serve on a street, or, like, what did that mean for you? It's different for everybody. Yeah. Like, I'm I'm on mission. Yeah, I'm true, true, true. I'm constantly on mission. Yeah. I just live in Concord, New Hampshire, but I'm a missionary <laughs> with a business. Yes. So, like, what did that mean for you? So, my first taste of, like, being able to, like, serve the Lord um, was I went on a mission trip with uh, the church that I was a part of to Honduras, like, at the end of my senior year in April. And... Um, we did orphan ministry and whoa how cool for you yeah I was just like my heart oh my gosh is there so much because I was like I know that these kids don't know love you know like I and I was able to like give them that love give them like just connect with them and like a lot of these kids in in like went through some crazy experiences of their own um and so I was I I just I loved being able to be there and to like love on them and, and just, yeah, share their company. Um, and that was like the first taste of like mission that I had. Whoa. And I was just like, oh, I want more, you know, like that thirst, <laughs> that thirst. I all found over it. Again. Yeah. My passion. Oh gosh. So like, I knew that like, okay, like I, I don't want to go to college. Like, of course, like I want to get a degree and, you know, be a contributing member of society, but like, I really want to serve the Lord. Um, And so I found this program called NET Ministries. NET stands for National Evangelization Teams. And what we do is we travel the country putting on retreats. Excuse me. Putting on retreats for youth. Um, We go to schools. We go to parishes, churches, like, and just share the gospel, share testimony, share, um, we do, like, skits and dramas and, you know, just, like, 
Love it. Give them a an experience of the Lord. Yeah. Um, we pray with them, like all those things. And it was in this program. I did one year out of high school, went to college, and then two more years with them. Um, but this program formed me in my faith so much. Like wow. this was where I had experiences of the Holy Spirit, of like deeper prayer, of like, like I knew, like I can, I, it's through this program that I know that like, no matter what happens in my life, like I'm not going to walk away from the Lord. Mm. Um, like I'm, I'm that rooted that like, I know nothing can happen. And so I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Baby. And at this point in my life, like I was finding like my identity and that's as a child of God, you know, like I didn't, yes, I, I like I'm adopted and there's all those questions that like come with that. But like, really it was just like learning, like my first citizenship is in heaven, you know, yeah. like my first identity, my first identity is as a daughter of God. Um, and this is when anxiety was like really low in my life. Like I really wasn't experiencing it that much. Um, and like, you know, flare ups here and there, but nothing, nothing too crazy. And if I could just jump in here for a second, I, yeah. I love what you just said, because I was just reading it this morning in Matthew seven, right? Jesus said, you know, the, the man, the woman that builds their house on the rock, the winds will come, the storms will come, the waves will come, and that house will stand, right? The, the, the person that hears and does and comes and joins themselves to Jesus. And that's actually the, the wording of the, the, the Passion Translation, right? And they say, well, geez, we prophesied in your name and we heal people in your name. And, and Jesus says, uh, well, you never joined yourself to me. And so that's what I hear you talking about, right? When you talk about that foundation, you're talking about you made a decision during that time in your life to build your life on Jesus, the rock, yeah, the, the foundation. And so although you're going to experience the storms of life, you're still going to stand. Yeah. Where others, uh, and you talked about them, right? You could have easily had a completely shipwrecked life. Yeah. And so I just wanted to take a minute, minute for those that are listening, right? Um, that are listening to your story going, well, what's, what's so special about Danny? And we're going we're gonna to hear about some of this freedom here in a second. Well, that's what's special about Danny is she went through traumatic, traumatic uh, experiences for, for many years. But she came to a point in her life where she made the decision for herself, how am I going to live? And she chose to live joined to Jesus and having him be her foundation and she went all in she moved all of her chips in on jesus and here she is today a completely free person and i just think i just wanted to really for the listeners you already knew this danny but really for the listeners those listening going trying to locate as they listen to this podcast trying to locate themselves where am i um, and yeah, maybe you've been raised in the Christian circles and yeah, we all, we all were all three of us standing here or sitting yeah. here. We were all raised Catholic and maybe you're, you're raised, you know, in a Pentecostal house or in a whatever house where you've been around the Christian thing, but you as a person, there comes a point in type where you have to make the decision for yeah. yourself. Am I going to join myself to Jesus and build my life on him? Yeah, you have to choose it. The reason I was excited for you to come on is, you know, we shared this a little bit before the program, but so many droves and droves of people are battling anxiety, stress, panic attacks, depression. Those four, and suicide, those five, especially in young adults right now, I would say are rampant. And so your, your testimony is amazing. So you come off of these missions trips... Um, and you're like probably like the rest of us who have done those things, like yeah. just soaring. Like, oh high. my gosh, yeah. yes, <laughs> ready to conquer the world. Yeah, I mean, you really feel like you can do anything after totally. you do those things, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, it was it was such an amazing experience, like doing those things. So part of what I'm after with this podcast is to bring those experiences into our everyday life. Yeah. Right? So we don't have to separate ministry anymore from. Yeah. Encountering Jesus right now. Right. We don't have to separate Holy Spirit from Sunday morning right. to Tuesday morning. The laundromat. It's the, it's the office, the parking lot, the yeah. coffee shop. And we've talked the about these room. things. And so the other reason I really wanted you on was because 
your 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 story is it, it's so rampant and it's possible that we could help thousands of people with the same issue yeah so you come off this trip where where are you at so you're like the, the panic, the, the anxiety is still kind of what I would call under the surface. Yeah. So it was about last year. Um, I was doing my final year on mission, but I, I wasn't traveling. I was uh, working as a supervisor for NET, um, which means like I can stay. I live in a house in a community with women. and um, That's so cool. I didn't know you did that. It's amazing. Like we get up in the morning and we pray together. and So then, it's very similar to Circuit Riders or YWAM or... The programs oh, yeah. my daughters have been through. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Now I see the connect. Yeah, it's it's very similar. Um, and so like I was living in this community, um, but then uh, where was that located? Uh, West St. Paul, Minnesota. Wow. Yeah. Pronounce um, Minnesota. Minnesota. Don't oh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you so played good. a hockey in Minnesota. <laughs> yes, I had such a hard Minnesotan accent when I left. <laughs> <laughs> I got here and I was like. Dad, when are we gonna go on the boat? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, the bag. In the get your yes, bag. <laughs> get your bag. Yeah, <laughs> I love Minnesota. Like all my friends are still out there. Like I love Minnesota so much. Like that's where I really found my community. I hope to go back one day, but right now the Lord has me here. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah. me too. Um, so yeah, it was about so last year. Back, you moved back out of that environment to New Hampshire. Like, what brought you back here? So your family my what I was going through my anxiety so like it really started la- in my last year of doing mission um obviously like COVID hit in the middle of it which changed so much but at the beginning of last year um I realized that like I really wanted to um take my healing from sexual assault like head on like yes I'd healed in many many ways and I had gone through a lot of forgiveness of <clears throat> for that person and and for that situation but I really wanted to just like work it over with someone who was like trained to do so you know which is important so important um and so um obviously working through this amps up anxiety in your life and so I started experiencing it a little bit more like some more panic attacks and um you know like the physical side of it um came in more and then obviously COVID hit, which changes the situation. Like we had to shut down our ministry and, um, you know, like when you're stuck in a house for like six months, like there was just like so much going on in your head. Like, I mean, everyone who's listening to this has gone, I'm sure through the same thing. And, um, so you get a little antsy. You do. <laughs> um, and bored. Yes. Um, and so like, I was still like working for the ministry. Um, but like, I felt like I had no purpose cause I wasn't serving any, like I wasn't helping the missionaries, you know, right. like they all went home. Um, and yeah. And I was also facing like healing and, um, it, you know, like anxiety really came out of nowhere just like suddenly in May. Um, I just like remember one night, it was a Monday night. I was just like watching some funny YouTube videos and suddenly I was just like, oh, I don't feel good. Um, and because of my anxiety, I'm prone to fainting and stuff like that. So like when I don't feel good, like I, my housemates knew like, okay, I'm going to tell you that way you can check up on me in case like anything happens, you know? And so like I, I let my housemates know, I was like, hey, can you just check up on me in a few minutes? Like I'm not feeling good. Just make sure I'm okay. And um, suddenly like I was just like, in the bathroom and I felt like nauseous and I also felt dizzy and um just like I felt terrible um and I started f- to feel like I was gonna black out or faint so like I grabbed my phone and quickly texted like my housemates like help me like that's literally like all I could get out and like I don't even remember hitting send because I was blacking out as I sent it whoa and um and then Uh, yeah I like started going through like what looked like seizure activity like I like in it it, this episode happened for an hour and a half um of just like like blacking out and having seizure like symptoms and just like not being there and eventually they had to call like the ambulance because they couldn't get me out of it and anything and so um I was I went to the hospital and I was like in the ICU for two days just because of like 
what was like going on like physically and so, like the doctors like couldn't figure out why they said like it's nothing in your brain i was just about to say you know my guess is they found nothing yes yes and the, i i'm anybody listening i can tell you unequivocally without mm-hmm. a doubt a hundred percent when they can't find anything there's only one answer for that yeah it's demonic yeah and so I'm not saying you you had a demon. I'm saying that spiritual attack yeah. against your life and destiny and mission is not from the good guys. Yeah. It's from the bad guys. Yeah. And so you have to identify where is this coming from? When did this start? What was the door that was open? And so you come out of that ICU encounter. You you probably basically then get sent home. No, I I was you still stayed? living there. Oh I my stayed. Gosh. I stayed until <laughs> I, I'm committed. I, I I stay when I need to stay. Um, but like it was for about a week and a half after. Like I had to go back to the hospital a few times. Like I was still experiencing these episodes, but like nothing. Nobody knew anything. Yeah. Um, eventually it came down to okay, like maybe this is anxiety, and so like I started <clears throat> getting put on anxiety medication. Which helped, um, for sure. But, like, because it, it helped in the way that, like, my symptoms weren't as severe. Like, I wasn't right having seizure activity anymore. But, like, I would still go into the, this panic and um, start to not feel good and things like that. And it was getting to the end of my time with my ministry. And I was just, like, I, I, I couldn't do I was, like, very debilitated by this anxiety. Like, I couldn't drive. Like, I was just, like... Because if I ever started to feel good, like, I was anxious about having anxiety. Like, it was almost like this terrible circle Domino effect. of, like, if I start to feel crippling, sick, and then I'm going to pass out, and then I'm going to have the seizure, and no one's, like, it was just, te- it was terrible. It had taken over at this point. Yeah. It, like, completely controlled my life. Like, I couldn't go out. I couldn't drive. I couldn't hang out with friends. Like if I wanted to go out and have a good night with friends, like one night we were at a bonfire and I'm like, I'm an extrovert. I'm a social person. I love hanging out with people, but I had to leave early. Cause like I left like 20 minutes into being there because I just, I, my anxiety got so bad. And so it was about this time that I realized like, okay, like I need, I need to go home. Like my plan was to live in Minnesota and to like live out there with my friends and everything. But like it just got to a point where like I couldn't care for myself I couldn't like I didn't know if I was going to be able to like get over it or drive or just like hold a job you know like I had no idea and so so you get home and when what time frame was that about in June or yeah so I moved home my mom flew out and drove back with me um wow at the end of June so I got home like end of June early July so that was right around when we started the collective outside at the farmhouse here in New Hampshire. Yeah. So how did you hear about the collective then? Like what? Yeah. So after a few weeks of being home, my friend Vanessa reached out to me because um, we did the same ministry. <clears throat> Excuse Love me. Vanessa. Love Vanessa. Vanessa, you're great. Um, and uh, she was just like, I've since I realized I had to move home, like I had been praying relentlessly for community and fellowship because in my parish, I didn't find that. Like I didn't know how to, how to get that. Like I didn't know there was this young adult community in New Hampshire. Like that was not possible in my eyes. Um, and so I was just like, Lord, like, please, like if I need to make the community, I will make it, but please like I need community. Um, and I was like, really just like, At this point, like, after moving home, I was just, like, really low in my faith. Like, I would get up and pray because I, like, I knew that it was important for me. But I would just, like, sit there and just, like, I wouldn't have words to speak. And I was, like, almost, like, angry at my situation and, like, you know, angry uh, uh, just, like, about, like, yeah. Like, I almost had, like, no motivation to be in prayer and to be with Jesus. Um, I would do it because, like, I knew it was important. Um, Your discipline of... The heart connect was right there, though. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think all of us have had those moments where yeah. we go through the motions. We know the discipline of reading the Bible, yeah. being with others, and we do it, but something's kind of missing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So it was a few weeks into being home that Vanessa reached out to me and said, like, hey, like, I, there's this young adult community. I think you would love um, the 
like they do praise and worship very much like how what like what we're used to and um I was just like yes like I need community I will go and so it was like the week before my birthday because my birthday's at the end of July and I remember by my birthday I was like back in love with the Lord you know I was always in love with the Lord but I was like he gave me the grace to feel it um and so it was like the week before that I came to my first collective and it was just like so it was so good um being able to just like my first one I was just like Lord I just like I'm coming here to receive like to just to be like being a missionary it's like always in the back of my mind like oh I want to go pray over this person I want you know like (laughs) but I was just like no like Lord like but you did. You I prayed did. With my I daughter. did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you prayed with my daughter the I first did. night. I know. I remember. It, it was, was all so my sweet. heart. I was like trying to. I was like, no, Lord, I'm just here to receive. But <laughs> then I was like, okay, I gotta go pray. Um. <laughs> it was so cool. So we we uh, you start coming. You yeah. start really connecting with the community. Yeah. You, you know, just from my perspective, I felt like instant heart connect, instant family. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this girl. She's there's something special about her. And so you end up meeting, I'm just fast tracking a little bit. Yeah. Um, You end up meeting with a bunch of the people, you start making friends. Yeah. So through that process, one of the girls reached out to me and said, hey, Danny was wondering if maybe you would meet with her. And I said, of course, Yeah. that's the whole point. Like, let's be family. So we have you over for dinner. Mm -hmm. You share what you just shared for 45 minutes. You tell us your story. And... We wanted to pray with you. And yeah. at that point, wh- where was the anxiety? Um, where was the level of anxiety that you were at? Anxiety, it was not as much, it's not as severe as it was in Minnesota. Like I wasn't having seizures basically, um, but it was still pretty high. It was still pretty debilitating. Like I have a job as a nanny and it, I would be so anxious to take the kids to the park. Like, or even to come to the collective, like some, there was like a few times I left the collective early cause I was just feeling anxious. Um, and like, I just like, and then it goes into that circle of, if I'm feeling anxious, like it's going to get worse and worse, you know? So, um, it was, it was still there. Um, so we spent about, I don't know, 20 minutes together Yeah. and we did a a simple prayer Yeah. and, um, you know, it was special. And I remember the night because we did it, we did this, you know, I have this process i love to take people through where i have them stand up and picture themselves at the cross yeah and i've said this for years and i won't digress into the my little analogy but taking people through the cross yeah. i'm convinced majority of american churches are, are still at the front of the cross yeah and chronologically when we take people through the cross we're supposed to leave stuff there yeah because he's resurrected on the other side it's an open tomb then there's holy spirit encounters and yeah. so I laid that out for you very briefly. And then I have people on the count of three walk through yeah. the cross. And I remember doing that with you and your shoulders pop back. That was the moment. And your countenance, everything pivoted about you. Yeah. And this like, oh, there was this almost this countenance of, oh my God, something left. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really did. Like I, I desired healing and freedom so much from anxiety. Like I remember I asked you to pray with me a couple times at collective and you know, like uh, <clears throat> you wanted it so bad. I wanted it so bad. This. And like in those moments, like God gave me grace and peace. Like I felt that. Um, but I just like, it, it still would come back, but it was in that moment of like, I felt it taking that step forward that I knew something was different, you know, like, and, and of course, like there's that, like there was that worry, I, that, that lack of Did faith that, right. that was just like, okay, like I've, I've tried praying for it many times. Like maybe it'll come back, but like I changed my outlook as well. Like when I got home, like whenever I thought I, anxiety was starting to creep back into my life, like I would cast it out and I would claim that freedom and I would claim that healing. And when for months on end I would be having these panic attacks and like anxiety was debilitating my life like since that moment of taking that step forward of claiming my freedom and healing from anxiety like I've had no anxiety since like (laughs) it's been a couple of months it's been a couple months and like it hasn't been that long since I started having anxiety you know like I just I like I'm still like not that I'm like surprised, but like, cause the Lord is 
the Lord and I've, you know, but like. You're free. I'm free. Yeah. And it's, it's like, that is all I've wanted for so long is that freedom. And. Yeah. I, but my daughter went to dinner with Danny. Like I would say maybe six weeks after that yeah. time at our home. And I hadn't talked to Danny. I didn't, I just thought, well, you know, whatever. I mean, <laughs> I did what the Lord told me to do. And Alicia calls me the next day and she was like, uh, dad, um, like, so I saw Danny last night and I was like, oh my gosh, how is she, you know, <laughs> she's, a, he's, uh, she said, well, she's making you cookies. And I was like, yeah, I love cookies. <laughs> Cause it was approaching Christmas. And she was like, yeah. no dad, like Danny is completely free. Like she's completely different. Like something happened. Like she has not had, and I was like, what, why didn't she tell me? Yeah. And I was so happy for you. And. And I'm thrilled that you got that level of freedom because, and that's what I wanted to have you on is to let people know, because I know there's thousands battling this, that it's possible. There is no anxiety in heaven. There's no anxiety there. There's not even a shadow of a flower that blooms. I want you to think about that. There's not even a, a dark shadow. There's so much light radiating. There's no shadows. So... We know it's possible to be free from this. And I'm thankful that you shared your story, Danny, and that. So like, so you're like, you're free. I'm like, free. And you have to, you have to fight for that. So what yeah. physically, I know pathways in our brain, for those listening who are scientific, when those pathways start to change, what happens is the nervous system and the spirit, man, there's, there's uh, muscle memory, just like an athlete. So But now that you have this freedom, you can sense when that thing tries to rear up and you can vain imaginations, you can speak to them and say, no, no, not again. And you hold your ground. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's where you're at. Like your, your, your level of freedom hit maybe a peak and you're, you're standing on that. Yeah. Which is, that's called biblical life. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, like I, I mean, I had listened to Julie's story on your podcast and like how like she started to heal, like definitely through like reading the Bible and like, you know, casting those things away. And um, I was doing that like even before we met, but like, um, yeah, just like ever since, just like, you know, like you, you, you dive into the word, you dive into the gospel, you dive into a deeper relationship with Jesus and like 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 I think like one of the things like I want people to know is like don't stop asking the Lord like be persistent in your asking and your prayers for for healing and for freedom because I'd been asking for a long time and like yes like that hope was dimming but like I still was faithful to that prayer and the Lord was faithful to me in it and yeah like and and ever since you know like maybe if like a few times especially like right after it was like more more closer to them that like i would feel it coming in and i would just like no like jesus in your name i claim freedom like Mm. by the power of your blood like i have this freedom that's very typical yeah residue i call it residue it's like when dirt settles at the bottom of the glass when you go through one of those freedom prayers the residue kicks up yeah in the glass and so you have to you have to go through the process of just cleaning it out running the water through another filter a lot of it is in our minds yeah and if we learn the the new way of our pathways working we rewrite those pathways and all of a sudden you forget you just start to forget that you even had a problem yeah and you start to go well oh yeah years ago i battled that but not anymore (laughs) Yeah, yeah yeah and you start to rewrite and rewire and faith and hope get released and they outweigh the bad yeah and so i'm thrilled that you shared um and for those listening you know it's possible it's possible to get a level of freedom that you've never had and heaven's realities can become real and the holy spirit is a real person we've talked about this on the show and danny you can totally see it in your life your countenance um so for those listening Tune in again for another show coming up on Kingdom Come, and we're going to check out. Thanks, guys. 
So guys, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you have any questions about my testimony, about how the Lord has worked in my life, about Christianity in general, maybe you are not familiar um, with Christianity or anything like that, feel free to shoot me a message, follow me on Instagram, um, any of those such things. That way we can connect and get to know each other more. I would love to know who my followers are. So that'd be awesome. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll catch you on the flip side. Bye. Thank you.